HIV and AIDS. I'd like to start off with a brief history. In Los Angeles, um, between 1967 and 1978, there were two cases of pneumocystis carinii pneumonia. So this is a fungal pathogen that typically infects uh, individuals with a weakened um, immune, immune state. And so, but interestingly, in 1979, there were five cases of pneumocystis pneumonia all in one year. So in 10 years, two cases. In 1979, five all at the same time. And these individuals were homosexual men. And so that was the first indication that there was some kind of um, behavior or something going, going around in the um, community that was resulting in severe immunodeficiency. And the, um, in total, the AIDS epidemic has resulted in um, over 170,000 cases as of 1999 and, and um, probably much higher since then. And so here we see the um, pneumocystis spores of this, again, of this particular fungal pathogen in um, sputum from an individual's, an infected individual's lungs. Another, another um, rare disease that was popping up in the um, community, homosexual community at the time, was Kaposi sarcoma, these, um, this typically non-aggressive um, rare form of cancer and that uh, afflicts muscle and skin. And so in this particular case, um, you know, it's often found in the elderly as a non-aggressive, in a non-aggressive form. Um, and it's, again, it's extremely rare and usually um, focused on immunocompromised individuals. But in 1981, there were 26 cases of KS and all the individuals were young males um, and, and um, from San Francisco and New York and homosexual. So again, this was very consistent with what was being seen with pneumocystis carinii. And so um, between 1981 and 1999, there were nearly 47,000 definitive cases of KS. Again, um, supporting that something about the lifestyle was, was causing a severe immunodeficiency. At the time, it was debated whether it was some kind of drugs, um, nightclub drugs or something like that that they were using. Um, but, um, you know, obviously, eventually people realized that it was the spread of a particular immunodeficiency virus. Um, KS was ultimately as, um, associated with a human herpes virus, HHV8. And so HHV8 was isolated pretty consistently from the le from lesions of infected individuals to show that this virus was piggybacking on top of the HIV um, infection. AIDS at the time was referred to as GRID or gay-related immune deficiency, which obviously is quite derogatory and, and individuals did not like that. In the same way as I talked about before, how um, leprosy patients do not like to be called lepers, not surprisingly. And, and so Hansen's disease replaced leprosy and GRID was replaced with um, AIDS or acquired immune deficiency syndrome. So some of the distinguishing characteristics um, at the time as they're built, trying to build up the epidemiological evidence for what it, to discover what it was, there, there was clusters of infected men at the time. There was an apparent concentration within sexually interactive groups. So that was the first indication that it was something transmissible. Um, individuals with a high number of sex partners. There was a contingent of individuals that had, hadn't belonged to particular sexual groups but had received blood transfusions. And, and there were a fair amount of IV drug users and that had um, um, some characteristics mentioned previously, such as high numbers of sex partners. Hemophiliacs um, were also starting to, sh to show up positive, and this was particularly in um, some small children that were receiving clotting factors that were contaminated uh, with, um, with HIV. And obviously at the time, nobody knew about HIV, so they weren't looking for it or screening for it in blood. And so the fact that hemophiliacs were getting it uh, as a result of receiving clotting factors suggested that um, it was, again, some transmissible agent, but not something unique to the gay community. And then um, female sex partners of AIDS, AIDS positive IV drug users and hemophiliacs were also um, testing positive. So in general, this overall suggested an infectious agent that was probably transmitted by sex and blood. One of the um, earlier uh, 
um, t attempts to describe the disease resulted in this sort of unfortunate um, categorization, the 4-H clot, which homosexuals, uh, homosexuality, hemophilia, heroin use, and Haitian origin, actually. And so the, the Haiti connection wasn't as clear as the, as the other three, but it turns out that a lot of individuals that lived in Haiti um, had, um, ra were raised in sort of a French-speaking culture. And so um, when, when um, a lot of the uh, you know, colonizing French <laughs> in Africa had started pulling up and, and leaving, and leaving a lot of these civilizations to their own devices, the, um, there were a lot of, you know, there was a lot of requirement for, for African-American individuals that, that could speak French. And so Haitians fit that bill fairly well. And plus they were poor and needed jobs and, and jobs that couldn't be provided on their island. So a lot of, a lot of Haitians moved to Africa and, you know, obviously worked and then came back home and brought money home. And so that's believed to have been the uh, influx of HIV into, uh, in, into um, Haiti. As far as the AIDS case definition, um, <clears throat> there's a few different uh, types of diseases that would make uh, an individual um, that, 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 are, that are AIDS defining conditions. In other words, things that aren't particularly common in the normal population and only appear in individuals that are severely immunocompromised. And so uh, HIV-related encephalopathy, um, cytomegalovirus retinitis with a loss of vision suggests severe immunodeficiency. Um, As I already mentioned, pneumocystis urovici pneumonia. So again, Carinii was renamed to urovici. Um, chronic intestinal cryptosporiosis, invasive cervical cancer. So this is just an example, and obviously you can put Kaposi sarcoma on here as well. Over here is a more objective clinical uh, uh, picture where individuals that um, have CD4 T cell counts that are less than 200 cells per cubic milliliter, I'm sorry, <laughs> millimeter, um, would be considered immunodeficient to the point of probably having um, AIDS. The, the, the normal count is, you know, near a thousand. So some HIV um, or AIDS, HIV AIDS statistics, about, you know, 37 million people in the world are infected as of 2017. Ha more than half of those are from um, African countries. About 1.8 million new cases every year. 65% of these in sub-Saharan Africa. Super high infection rates, 35% in some areas nearly a million deaths, and as of 2017, about 2.2 million Western and um, Central U uh, U.S. Um, citizens living with HIV, about 12,000 total deaths in the U.S. in 2017, but again, you know, nearly a million worldwide. So here's a um, representation of the, um, of the HIV particle. And so you can see just a variety of the features that are included in this virus. So um, obviously it's a enveloped virus. So you can see the envelope here and then the various spikes sticking out. So the primary um, docking glycoprotein is called GP120. And the stalk itself the tr is a GP41, glycoprotein 41, which is the transmembrane glycoprotein. The virus um, within the envelope has a has a series of matrix proteins that provide structure, and then it has this sort of conical shaped nucleocapsid. Here's its viral genome, so it's two plus strands of RNA that can behave as messenger RNA. The virus brings an array of of enzymes with it as well, such as protease, integrase and the primary um, replication enzyme, reverse transcriptase. So just a little bit about these viruses. Now HIV belongs to a family of viruses called the retroviruses, which were first discovered by Howard Temin and David Baltimore, and they won the Nobel Prize for it. Um, <clears throat> some of the properties of the reverse transcriptase is that uh, it uses single-stranded RNA as a template 
for double-stranded DNA synthesis, which is really unusual. Usually these single-stranded RNA viruses will encode a, a, the opposite polarity RNA, and then the opposite polarity RNA will be used as a template to make genomes. And in addition, um, will allow for transcription and translation. But in this particular case, retroviruses <laughs> don't work that way, as the name suggests. Another property of reverse transcriptase is that it's very low fidelity. I mean, it has a high mutation rate due to the lack of editing function. And so again, I've, I showed you at the end of the Ebola lecture the um, relative mutation rates, and HIV is right up there at the very top. And so <clears throat> the um, um, some of the impacts of dis disco the discovery of reverse transcription and retrovirus is that it amended the central dogma. So the central dogma is basically stating basically states that DNA is used as a template to make RNA, and then RNA is translated into protein. But um, um, another cool thing about it is that the um, um, discovery of reverse transcriptase provided a sense of, of relief because people thought it could be a target against viruses, so an antiviral target. And so indeed some of the first drugs that, were, that came out against HIV were targeted against the, reverse, the unique re reverse transcriptase, in this particular case AZT, which I'll talk about. And obviously we use reverse transcriptase a lot in biotechnology to do um, um, RT-PCR, reverse transcriptase PCR. But I don't want to get into all that. <clears throat> so here's a representation of the HIV genome. And again, you see the, the um, one strand here. And again, it's a plus strand of RNA, so it behaves just like messenger RNA. It's got a cap, five prime cap, and a three prime um, um, poly A tail. And then here's the other copy. And then you can see the, the regions of, of genetic um, um, or the region, the genomic regions within this fragment, these fragments. 